Welcome. Welcome to this BART online service. The last time I introduced a service like this, the heavens opened. It poured hard. The water was pouring from my roof. And today I want the heavens to open again and let our praise reach God. Let us sing loud and from our heart as we join together to worship in Christ's name. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord our rock. and song for the Lord our God is great we are his people gathered here we worship in his name and our mouths will sing your praise and our empty hands we will raise will bow down in worship kneel before the Lord for our God is great King above all if you hear his voice today open up your heart for the Lord he is our maker He is our maker We are His people Gathered here we worship in His name And our mouths Will sing your praise And our empty hands bow down in worship kneel before the Lord for our God is great King above all our mouths will sing your praise and our empty hands we will raise and we will bow down in worship Kneel before the Lord, for our God is great, King above all. Our God is great, King above all. It is through grace that God forgives and calls us his children. Father, forgive us when we fail to reflect your grace in our lives. And thank you, Lord, that you do forgive us, that through your love, and your grace and your concern for us that we stand unblemished we praise you and thank you in jesus name amen our gospel reading is from matthew chapter 18 verses 1 to 7. at that time the disciples came to jesus and asked who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung round their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. This is the Gospel of Christ. Our reading from Romans is uh, chapter 14, and I'm going to read to you from the message version. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way that you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something that you don't agree with, even when it seems that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who's been around for a while might well be convinced that he can eat anything on the table, while another with a different background might assume all Christians should be vegetarians and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticising what the other ate or didn't eat? God, after all, invited them both to the table. Do you have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. Or say one person thinks that some days should be set aside as holy, and another thinks that each day is pretty much like any other. There are good reasons either way. So each person is free to follow the convictions of conscience. What's important in all this is that if you keep a holy day, keep it for God's sake. If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. If you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. None of us are permitted to insist that our own way in these matters. It's God we are answerable to, all the way from life to death and everything in between, not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again, so that he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. So where does that leave you when you criticise a brother? And where does that leave you when you condescend to a sister? I'd say it leaves you looking pretty silly, or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Read it for yourself from Scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, 
every knee will bow before me, every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and only I am God. So tend to your knitting. You've got your hands full just taking care of your own life before God. Forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here's what you need to be concerned about, that you don't get in the way of someone else, making life more difficult than it already is. I'm convinced, Jesus convinced me, that everything as it is in itself is holy. We, of course, by the way we treat it or talk about it, can contaminate it. If you confuse others by making a big issue over what they eat or don't eat, you're no longer a companion with them in love, are you? These, remember, are persons for whom Christ died. Would you risk sending them to hell over an item in their diet? Don't you dare let a piece of God-blessed food become an occasion of soul poisoning. God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach, for goodness sake. It's what God does with your life as he sets it right, puts it together and completes it with joy. Your task is to single-mindedly serve Christ. Do that and you'll kill two birds with one stone, pleasing the God above you and proving your worth to the people around you. So let's agree to use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help others with encouraging words. Don't drag them down by finding fault. You're certainly not going to permit an argument over what is served or not served at supper to wreck God's work among you, are you? I said it before, and I'll say it again, all food is good, but it can turn bad if you use it badly, if you use it to trip others up and send them sprawling. When you sit down to a meal, your primary concern should be to not to feed your own face, but to share the life of Jesus. So be sensitive and courteous to the others who are eating. Don't eat or say or do things that might interfere with the free exchange of love. Cultivate your own relationship with God, but don't impose it on others. You're fortunate in if your behaviour and your belief are coherent, but if you're not sure, if you notice that you are acting in ways inconsistent with what you believe, some days trying to impose your opinions on others, other days just trying to please them, then you know that you're out of line. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. This is the word of the Lord. So we are getting towards the end of Paul's letter to the early church in Rome. Unlike Paul's other letters, he writes this one to a church he hasn't been to yet. News, though, had reached him about the tensions there between different factions of believers. Over the last few years, we have dipped into and out of this great letter. And we've heard how Paul writes about, in chapters 1 to 3, our needs. Paul shows how we are all guilty before God. In chapters 3 to 4, we heard of God's answer, that it is through Jesus that we are put right with him. 
And in chapters five and eight, we heard that we find new life and what it means to be a Christian. In chapters nine to 11, Paul looks at how all of this affects us and affects particularly the Jewish people. And in chapters 12 to 15, we find some real practical stuff about living as a Christian at a very everyday level. So here we are, slap bang in the middle of this practical session of our series, Transformed by Grace, looking at how to live as a gracious community. Have you ever seen grace transform whole communities? I went to university in the 1980s. It seems like a lifetime ago now, a different era. In many ways, it was completely different then. There was apartheid in South Africa. The violence and the troubles in Northern Ireland were rife and spilling over onto the streets of London. Communities were riven. But whilst I was living through these times, and heard about these divided communities, I didn't live in either of those worlds. But two things shocked me when I first got to university, both coming from new friends that I'd made who came from these different worlds. Firstly, one Sunday, uh, a new fresher, a Christian friend, invited me to go to church with them. It turned out that they were Catholic. What shocked me, though, was how similar the service in this Catholic church was to the Anglican one that I'd grown up in. And the second shock was the stories my new Northern Irish friend told. She had grown up in the midst of the troubles and spoke of the thoroughly divided community there. Children from Catholic and Protestant families did not mix. They grew up suspicious and fearful of each other. They somehow thought the other were a different species. I just couldn't understand how they had ended up so divided. My friend thought if only she could get kids out of that environment and get them to mix together at a summer camp, they may just realise that underneath it all, they were just kids who wanted to do what kids want to do. And so her idea was to have camps uh, in Durham, where we were at university, that welcomed these kids in Jesus' name. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus says, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. These kids came from an environment where there were ample influences for them to stumble. In verse 6 of our Gospel reading, it says, If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung round their neck. A bit harsh, maybe. But these kids came from harsh places and needed space to be kids. Jesus calls us all to become like kids. So we set about making her vision happen and Northern Irish Encounter was born with the summer camps in Durham with kids from schools across the divide transformed by grace and each other and developing lasting memories and friendships for life and a future of possibility. These camps carried on after we all had graduated, taken on by the next generation. We experienced by prayer and by grace a fragile yet transformed community of kids. Kids that have now grown up. Kids that have benefited from the transformations then and what then subsequently occurred through 
the Good Friday Agreement. In chapter 14 of Romans, Paul talks of living in gracious community. The church in Rome was divided, divided between those who promoted a strict observance of food and Sabbath laws and those with a more liberal and liberated view. Some people were getting so obsessed with their own way of doing things as church that they were convinced that others who held different views were wrong. But Paul urges them not to destroy the Lord's work by putting stumbling blocks in the way of others, by not making mountains out of molehills, by not having disputes about trivial and immaterial things. Do we recognise and see such differences today? Maybe even in our parishes? Maybe in the way that we've viewed church as we've had to move online? The problem for some of the new Christians in Rome that Paul was writing to, especially those who had grown up as strictly observant Jews, was that all their lives they had been surrounded by a multiplicity of rules and regulations. When they became Christians, they found at a stroke that those rules were abolished. The danger was, though, that they might interpret this newfound freedom as licence to do exactly as they liked. We need to remember that Christian freedom and Christian love go hand in hand. Freedom and love for one another are bound up together. In verse 17 of Romans, Paul writes, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Or as we heard read earlier in the message version, it has it, God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach, for goodness sake. It's what God does with your life as he sets it right, puts it together and completes it with joy. Paul talks of righteousness. He sets it right, giving to others and to God what is their due. To others, it's, it is sympathy and consideration. To God, it's worship and praise. We can't do that and then go on to do whatever we like. Paul talks of peace putting things right. This isn't just peace man or an absence of trouble. This isn't a negative thing, it's intensely positive. The unrestrained freedom we have in Christ is conditioned by an obligation to live in right relationship, to live in peace with each other. And Paul talks of joy. This isn't about making ourselves happy, but making others happy, even if it costs us personal limitations. Look what it says in verse 19 of Romans, where Paul writes, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Or again, in the more colourful language from the message, so let's agree to use all of our energy in getting along with each other. Help each other with encouraging words. Don't drag them down by finding fault. He talks again of peace. Peace in a fellowship. Peace in a community. Getting along with each other. A church where there is strife and contention, quarrels and bitterness, divisions and disagreements has lost the right to be called church. As William Barclay said, such a fellowship is not a fragment 
of the kingdom of heaven. It is simply an earthbound society. Do we see ourselves as a fragment of heaven? Paul also talks of edification, building each other up, encouraging each other, and giving each other the space to be the very best version of themselves. There are lessons for us all here. Let us stop passing judgment on others. When we put aside our differences and share the peace that we have through Christ, lives are transformed. I've seen it. I've seen how trivial differences in background and culture can be used to create division and deny our common humanity. I've seen how these differences evaporate when kids are taken out of their own environments and encounter each other in a safe and sacred space where maybe for the first time in their lives they realise they have more in common than they thought. We are called to be easy on each other, to seek what is common, to be mindful, to show humility, to adjust what we do in love for our brother and sisters. And as we work out new ways of being community, new ways of being a church family together, let us pray for humility. Let us pray for guidance on how to show each other Christian love. And Lord, let us be transformed as a community living in love through the grace of your Son, our Rescuer and Friend. Amen. my
Heavenly Father, you know our struggle to serve you when sin spoils our lives and overshadows our hearts and minds. Come to our aid and turn us back to you again. With a simple trust and childlike hearts, we acknowledge your amazing grace, a grace that brings an undeserved mercy that comes to us again and again. We pray for our country and those in roles of leadership at this difficult time. We ask you to direct, sanctify and govern the hearts and minds of those in authority. Give them wisdom and integrity as they continue to make the necessary decisions to guide us through this challenging time. We pray for peace, justice and reconciliation among the nations and bring to you the troubled areas of our world gripped by sickness, war and poverty, for the religious, political and civil unrest of our time and the ongoing struggle for power. We commend the world in which Christ rose from the dead to the mercy and protection of God. Lord Jesus, you understood people's fears and pain before they spoke of them. We ask that you would speak into the hearts and lives of all those who are suffering Help us to bind up the brokenhearted and comfort all who mourn. In a moment of silence, we bring to you those that are especially on our hearts at this time. We pray for those that find themselves in nursing or care homes, away from the familiarity and comfort of routine and loved ones. We pray too for those in hospital. Grant them your grace. Surround the frightened with your tenderness. Give strength to those in pain. Hold the weak in your arms of love and give hope and patience to those who are recovering. We pray for all nursing, care home and hospital staff, medical researchers, healthcare workers and first responders those enabling track and trace. Bless them as they carry out their work. Sustain, uphold and inspire them, we pray. May your grace bring sustenance, strength and protection and may the light of Christ, which shines eternally, bring hope and renewal and healing. We pray for your church and its outreach and ministry opportunities as it continues to adapt to ongoing limitations at this time. Bless Linda and her ministry team, the BART PCCs, the church wardens and the treasurers, as they continue to make decisions and reimagine ways of being church. We thank you for the BART youth leaders and the children's team working to connect and minister to young people we pray for the BART community support team of volunteers as they continue to offer help to those that need it locally. Strengthen our resolve to take on the troubles of the troubled. May your grace transform our hearts and minds as we seek to build authentic community with one another. May your steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel come to characterise us, set our lives right, put us together and complete us with your joy. And lastly, we pray for ourselves as we cultivate our own relationship with you. Help us to live in ways that are consistent with what we believe. Thank you that your grace is transforming. Teach us how to live a life that is pleasing to you. We ask that you guard and lead us into the coming week. Direct our ways as we trust in your strength and protection. 
as we hold on to your promises and draw comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Love God with all your heart, soul and mind. And love one another as God loves you. We are called to love, to care, to seek justice and to strive for truth. May we live in grace, strengthened by God's Spirit. Go in peace. Go in love. And go in grace. Amen. I lift my praise, my arms I'll raise, I can see your shining face, and as I sing, you take me in, cover me. say